today? Good. Good, good. How are you at home? I hope you're good. <laughs> you guys want to pray with me? Father God, we thank you for bringing us together to worship you, whether here in our congregation or at home. And we just thank you, Father God, for the things that you're doing in our lives, the things that you're doing in our nation. We know that you're working, Father God. And just help us to have a positive outlook. Help us to know that you are in charge, that you are working on our behalf. And just please open our hearts, Father God, that we would know you more, that we would seek you more. And just help us to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. Help us to remember that worship is an active thing that we are doing, an active act that we are doing to show our love to you. And we just thank you, Father God. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You want to stand?
believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Now He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He's conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. Now He's coming back again. We believe. Come on, church, what do we believe this morning? What do you believe this morning?
it yet. I know that you're working on it. But I believe that you're faithful to finish and complete the good work that you started. We believe, Father God, that you are faithful. But even though we don't always see it, we may not always feel it, we know that you are faithful. Even when I see that you are
Just help us to seek you and to continually pray for your will to be done and not our own. We just thank you, Father God, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good to be back. Amen. I want to big, say a big thank you to everybody that... Uh, filled in for me while I was gone, uh, Terrell and John and David and Paul, they all filled in for me on Wednesday nights, appreciate that greatly. So good to be back here in Colorado, amen. If you want to turn in your Bibles this morning, it's going to be very easy, just turn to the first book in the first chapter. I'm starting a new series. I thought about this all the time that I was gone. And when you look at the world that we are living in, it's amazing to see how people look at the same thing and they see it so differently. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. And that is how to look at the world. And I've got some examples for you to remind you. This is sort of a classic. Is the glass half empty or half full? It all really depends on how thirsty you are. Somebody asked me earlier if this was regular tea. And I said, yes it is, because it's sweet tea. <laughs> Amen. The tea, or the glass question, is basically one that is more of an attitude. But what I'm talking about is going to be something that's even more intentional. It's sort of like this. I can wear my regular glasses. Or I can put on my 
shades. And the world looks differently. Some things are filtered out. I don't see them as much. And when you're driving, that's a good thing. However, I'm not a movie star, so I'm going to take them off. Go back to normal. Spiritually, what we see is demonstrated in a book that I was reading. And it talks about three friends who saw, they were visiting Africa, and they saw this scene, and up on the screen there for you who are there, you can see all these different animals that you would see. And one commented this way, the Lord has definitely created an amazing array of creatures that sing his praises and declare his glory to the ends of the earth. The next person looked at the same scene and said, an amazing array of creatures to be sure, but you err in ascribing their existence to a creator. No, these incredible animals are the result of the unguided, purposeless, purposeless combination of random mutation and natural selection. We too are the product of a natural evolutionary process. Indeed, we are no different from the creatures that we see. A third person chimed in. I pray you both will be enlightened to the full reality disclosed by our brothers and sisters in nature. For they too bear the same spark of divinity that lies within you and me. Do you not sense them calling to you, seeking to communicate with your spirit? We are all potential gods and goddesses. We just need to awaken to our heightened state and take hold of the possibilities before us. That's an excellent example of seeing the same thing, but seeing it in very different ways. And so we're going to be looking at various items. And this morning we're going to be looking at the most important item I would see that determines how to look at the world. And basically it's the answer to this question. Who is in charge? The answer, I think, is found in the first verse of the first chapter, Genesis. Chapter 1, verse 1. It very simply says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Or you could shorten it down to the first four verses. It says, In the beginning, God. God is in control. And so the question is that when you look at the world, is God in your sight? Does he factor in your view of the world? The Bible addresses those people who say there is no God. It simply says this. It says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Anyone who does not believe there is a God is classified scripturally as a fool. I'm not going into all the different reasons why you can believe in God. Paul in Romans chapter 1 argued very strongly there that there was a natural world that you could look at that you could see the creation around you and that all of that revealed a creator. The Bible also teaches that there is what's called 
special revelation where God speaks to people at various times and God has revealed himself to us in the natural world and in special revelation that this is God speaking to us and we'll get into this later on in that everybody has a book that they follow this is the book that we follow the Bible we believe that it is God's revelation I enjoyed listening to Paul talk last week about he and I had many arguments and discussions over the time period about how that he believed that things were written back then also had a purpose for today and that we need to be aware of that. Therefore, it's important. So, is God in your sight? Now, that brings up the second question, which is almost as important as, do you believe in a God? And that is, if your answer to the first question is, well, yes, there is a God, then you have to ask yourself, which God do we serve? Because there are many gods. There are many gods that are talked about. I'm amazed at listening to politicians sometimes try to quote, misquote, Scripture, always to their advantage. And Sheila will testify that if I'm watching them on television, I will start saying things, speaking back, calling them all sorts of various names. I try to keep it clean. I pray about it. Some of them, though, really test my patience. I've just got to confess. So there are a lot of different gods in the world. Just because someone says, I believe in God, or I believe in Jesus, okay, I want to know what God and what Jesus do you believe in? Now it's interesting, and we're looking here at the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, and in Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, you have two very powerful stories of creation. I don't know if you've noticed it or not. Genesis 1 is one story of creation, and it goes into the first couple of verses of Genesis chapter 2, but the majority of Genesis chapter 2 is an alternative story of creation. It's written from a different perspective. Now what's important is that they reveal different aspects about God and I think they're here at the very beginning of the Bible because it's teaching us at the beginning about the God that we serve. Now chapter one is the transcendent God who speaks. He says, let there be light and there is light. He is the God who speaks and things happen. I always imagine him as a three-piece suit, giving orders, sitting on the throne. He just speaks the word, and it happens. We're used to that model. A lot of people believe in a transcendent God, the God who created everything. A lot of people think God just sort of created everything, and then he just sort of walked away and sort of sort of left things alone. But chapter 2 is there to tell us that that view of God is totally wrong. Chapter 2 is the relational God who loves. Notice, read through it sometimes. It says that God planted a garden. It says that God formed man out of the clay. In other words, where in chapter 1 I see God wearing a three-piece suit, in chapter 2 he's got his sweatshirt and his blue jeans on. He's getting his hands dirty 
And so you have that relational God who loves. Because in relationship, that is the purpose of relationship, to love people. And everything in the Bible is telling us about a God who loves. And so you see, you have this two perspectives of God that I think, as chapter 1 and chapter 2 are there, have to be held together. That yes, He is the transcendent God who issues orders, but He's also the relational God who gets His hands involved in our life and gets down in the mess of living. You know, life is messy. Anytime you have a baby, you find out how messy it is. Because you feed them in one end and it comes out the other end. And they're always doing it. And one of the great goals of parenting is when you get them potty trained. That's when you say, Amen, Hallelujah, praise God. I think God spends a lot of time with baby Christians trying to get them potty trained. And just like there's rejoicing in heaven when one sinner is saved, it may not just be as loud, but I just sort of imagine there's got to be some kind of rejoicing that goes on when God says, Yay! We got another one trained up. And that's important. You take care of those babies because you love them. But then you work with them and you train them up and discipline them also. Because you love them. And so we have this picture of a God who controls the universe. Who created the universe. But we also have the picture of a God who gets involved in your life. That's the God that I want. I want the God who loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die upon a cross for us. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you see this transformation that takes place. Now there's a third aspect of God that the Bible also teaches, and that's when God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was speaking to Israel, and Israel had a hard time because they kept going off into idolatry. And God spoke to Isaiah, and he said, I want you to tell the people this. I want you to give them the test for a real God. There's plenty of fake gods that are out there in the world, but here's the test for someone who claims to serve a real God. And that is the one who tells the end from the beginning. That's why there's so much prophecy in the Bible. It's God predicting beforehand. And the one that is prophesied about more than any other is the coming of Jesus Christ. You read that, especially when you read the book of Matthew. Matthew is always saying, and this is fulfills this prophecy, and this fulfills that prophecy, and this fulfills... It's amazing, isn't it? All the prophecies that Christ fulfilled. Where he was born. The manner of his death. That one of his closest people would betray him. Even the amount of the betrayal. It would tell us about, it would prophesy about the tomb that he would be buried in, that it would belong to a rich man. It would prophesy that he would be executed with criminals. All of these specific prophecies. And Jesus himself prophesied. He told them 
three days and I will raise this temple. Three days. So they crucified him. They put a guard of Roman soldiers around the tomb to make sure that no funny business would happen, that nobody could come in and steal the body away and say, oh, he's risen. But there was a power that was greater than any here on the earth. And when the power of God descended on that first Easter Sunday morning, and that stone rolled away and the angels showed up, the soldiers could not get away fast enough. There was no power on earth or in hell that could stop the everlasting Son of God being raised from the dead. And so that became the foundation of our faith, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. More important than Scripture, more important than anything that we have, Jesus rose from the dead. And so we believe Scripture because it testifies to that. We believe the spiritual experiences that we have because Jesus testified and showed us the way and showed us that God had not walked away, but that God is still here and that God is still doing things. So which God do we serve? My answer is we serve the God of the Bible. We serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We serve the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. We serve the God of Peter and Paul and John and all the other disciples. That's the God we serve today. So which God do we serve? That God. Because he can tell us the end from the beginning. Now, what does that mean? I believe in God. What does that mean? I think there are three things, and there are probably dozens more that you could think of, but I think there are three important things that I want to share with you this morning. The first is, if there is a God, there is a moral component. If there is a God who has issued a law and commands and said, do this, don't do that, then there's a moral component. There is morality. Now, C.S. Lewis, in his masterpiece, Mere Christianity, argued that every person in the world, regardless of what they say, regardless of what they believe, feels this moral component, that we're born with it. And his example was, every time somebody does you wrong, cuts in line in front of you, takes something away from you, you feel wrong. That's morality. You look at the world and you see that everybody in the world does things wrong. And yet we expect to be treated right. Why is that? Lewis argued it's because we have within us. God has put within us a sense of morality that there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. When you believe in God, that becomes very apparent. There is right and there is wrong. Now, and this is so very important because as we go through this series, Paul talks about at the end of Romans chapter 1 that as civilizations degrade, there is a switch. Depravity. Perversion. 
And at the end of it, reprobation. And the way Paul defines reprobation is when you call evil good and you call good evil, you're a reprobate. And how do you get there when you think there is no God? When you act like there is no God. You set yourself up as a God. That's why so many cults, why so many of the governments in the world want to get rid of God. The attacks have just started. They will not stop because their goal, and they understand. Why are the regulations in some states so strong against churches? California, where you go to church, don't sing. Yet people can march on the streets and yell and scream without mask on, and that's okay. But don't you sing in church. Something bad may happen. It's an attack. We need to be pre prepared for it. We need to be looking and seeing and understand that there is morality in this world and that morality descends from God himself. And because we believe there is a God, there is a right and wrong and we can act on that. What does it mean if we believe in God? There is a sense of purpose. Purpose. We're going to get into this more next week. But as you go through Genesis chapter 1, there's a sense of purpose in creation. It begins with chaos. And as you go through chapter 1, what you find is that God is bringing order out of chaos. He begins to divide, and He begins to organize, and He begins to separate, and He begins to bring new things in, and He brings about order. I know in the modern world, they don't like order. We want to talk about, we want to get rid of order. We want to set up a new way of imagining things. But God gives us purpose. There's purpose in creation. There's purpose in humanity. There's purpose in your life and my life. That each one of us, God can speak to and that God can change. And the Bible is full of stories where people had a purpose. Joseph had a purpose to save the world of his day from starvation and to lead his family to safety. Moses had a purpose to lead his people out of bondage into a promised land. David had a purpose to become king of Israel. Daniel had a purpose to be a prophet of God and to be a great influence to a foreign king. John the Baptist had a purpose to come and prepare the way and the ultimate purpose, Jesus Christ, who was born in this world that he might die, that we might have everlasting life. And because we have that promise of everlasting life, we have purpose in this world, that God has called us, that he has saved us. Not just saved us to go to heaven, but he has saved us to a new life here on earth, to testify, to witness to show forth the light of God in the midst of the darkness. And in the world that we're living in, folks, is getting mighty dark.
dark. Our job is to let the light shine that people may see, as Jesus would say in the Sermon on the Mount, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. The third importance, if there is a God, there is a sense of belonging. We belong. We talk about the family of God. The Bible in the New Testament instructs us to address each other as a brother and sister. It instructs us to call upon God as our Father who art in heaven. We become part of the family of God. It even talks about inheritance, that we have become the heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That we have a sense of belonging. That our spirit bears witness to one another. That we become close to one another. That we're to interact with one another. That we're to gather with one another. We're to love one another, forgive one another, do good to one another. All those one another commands throughout the New Testament because we belong to each other. We belong to each other because we belong to the family of God. You may be sitting there and thinking, well, I don't like everybody. That's natural. I don't like everybody in my family. But guess what? They're in my family. And because they're in my family, they have rights and privileges nobody else does. We're part of the family of God. And that works for all of us. That means when I do something you don't like, you're supposed to forgive me. That's part of being in the family. If I'm doing something wrong, you're supposed to pray for me. If I need help and you can help me, you're supposed to reach a hand out to me. That's part of being a family. We belong to God because there is a God. Now we look in the world, and as I said, we've got to learn how to look correctly. And the very first thing that we must see, there is a God. He is in control. And as the psalmist said, we are His people, the sheep of His pasture. And because of that, we can glorify Him. We can say, praise God. Amen. I belong. I have a purpose. I am called here to do that which is right. And I will do it in the name of the one who saved me, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to pray for everyone that is here and everyone that is watching. I pray, God, that if anyone has not given their heart over to you, I pray that today would be the day that they would call upon your name and that they would say, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I'm ready to be saved. Lord, we pray for the needs of our land, our country. We see so much division. 
Help us who are people of faith to shine the light of Jesus Christ into this world like we've never done before. By our words and our actions, let us show the nature of Christ. Lord, we pray against this disease that it be ended swiftly. We pray for those who are hurting and in need. We pray for those who do not have work and pray, God, that you would give them jobs and opportunities. We pray for our church family, God, and lift them up before you. And we say, bless them, Lord. Bless them and be with them. God, we thank you for this. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, we allow questions to be texted in during the message that may have been risen. And our first question, which is a little hard for me to read. Do we have idols today? Okay. There are other, other questions. I ask them. use a little bit larger print. I've gotten a little older since I've been away. The question is a resounding yes. Well, the Christians worship idols. Yes. Paul defines covetousness as idolatry in the book of Colossians. When you see something it's not yours and you just want it so bad. I've got to do everything I can to get that. That is idolatry. So we may not have the statues around. But it's still idolatry. So yes, we do have idolatry today. So remember Okay, basically the question is this. What is, there's always been these periods where the Lord's coming back. If you lived through the 70s in the church world, you knew that Jesus was coming back in the 80s. Just knew it. People wrote books. I heard preachers preach sermons. Oh, he's got to be here. There was even a famous book that was written when Jesus will return in 1988. He didn't return in 1988. He had to write a sequel for the next year. Paul expected Jesus to come back in his lifetime. Only at the very end of his life did he realize that he was going to die and not go and be with the Lord. There's always been that expectancy. And God has left that for us intentionally because... We've always said, oh, it can't get any worse than this. He's got to come back. I heard that in the 70s. Oh, these people in the 60s with all the hippies. Oh, look at all these people and their songs and their long hair. Oh, how terrible. God's got to come back. And then AIDS hit in the 80s and 90s. Oh, look at this lifestyle. Oh, Things are so bad it can't get any worse than this. And then it got worse. And this year, it got really worse. And so the church has always looked in bad times with hope and with expectancy. Is there a hope that Jesus might come back? And the answer is, Yes, but he will come back not according to our timeline, but according to his. And so we can speculate and think, can't get any worse than this, and God's up there saying, oh yeah, just wait. 
it will. But at the right time and the right place, God will return. Okay? Many younger people are saying they are rejecting God because of the church. Have we presented God in the wrong way, or is it just their fruit for not accepting the God we present? This is a both and. I'm not going to blame one group or the other. The church has tailored too many things to try and make everybody happy. And that always leads to problems because no matter how much you make them happy today, it's not good enough for next week. We don't like words like sacrifice, discipline. And part of that has been because in our upbringing, we, won't, we, we believe in bigger and better. And so we try and gauge our churches successful as bigger and better. We're going to have to, one thing about 2020, we're going to have to define church differently. As we're seeing bigger and better is not even allowed now. We're going to have to focus on healthy instead of bigger. And we're going to have to become healthy churches and healthy believers. Now the people that are out there generally, what they're doing and the young people, and here I'm going to sound like an old man sitting on his uh, front porch saying, get off my lawn. We have the generations, and notice I said generations, where we have done very poor parenting. And we think, and children are raised up with the idea, the world has to make me happy. One of the great things that my boys did when they were teenagers is that they worked with my daddy, hanging gutters in the summertime. And there in Georgia, they would come home complaining about how hot it was, how hard it was. And my response was the same. I told them, remember that when you're in school. Because if you don't do good in school, that's the rest of your life. You can work outside, and it's gonna be hard, and it's gonna be hot in the summer and cold in the winter, and that'll be your life. Now, I had a parent in our church who heard that I was letting Paul and Daniel climb ladders. And she said, aren't you worried that they might fall off? And I said, the thought crosses my mind occasionally, but I'm more worried that they'll learn not to work. And I want them to learn how to work and be a good worker. And they're getting excellent training right now because I knew the one who was training them because he trained me. So we're going to have to do powerful evangelism in the coming years. And it's going to come down to not slick programs, but it's going to come down, I believe, to the power of God. The God who gets in their lives and who messes in their lives. That Genesis 2 God, that relational God that gets his hands dirty. That's what they need to hear. Okay? That's it. I hope you enjoy the series. I'm looking forward to doing even more next Sunday. It's good to be back. God bless you this week. I hope all of you have a great week. 
If you have any needs, feel free to call me. Thank you. God bless.